Hello and welcome to Noble TV. My name is Eugene Williams and I'm the uh, president of the Chicago chapter of Noble. We are the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Uh, and uh, thank you for tuning in this afternoon. We're glad that you're here. Uh, today we have a very, very exciting guest. We have with us Mr. Dean Angelo Sr. He is the president of the Chicago FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police, Chicago Lodge 7, and he's going to be talking with us today. Welcome, Dean. It's good to see you again. All right. Great. Now, we just want to remind you that you're live on Can TV Channel 21. If you have friends you want to watch or call in, tell them that they can watch. If they don't have cable, they can go to cantv.org slash hotline, and they can watch us on the Internet. So we're going to be taking some calls in a little bit. We're going to uh, talk with uh, President Angelo and take some calls. You see the, the uh, number at the bottom of your screen there, 312-738-1060. We're going to take some calls in a little while, but right now we're going to jump into it with uh, President Angelo. President, how are you? I'm good. Great, okay. great. You know, why don't we start by, you know, telling our viewers what it is that your primary role and responsibility is uh, with, with uh, Noble, but... Before we get into that, just tell us a little bit about your, 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 yourself in terms of uh, being on the Chicago Police Department and how you came to be president of uh, the FOP here in Chicago. Certainly. I, I took the police test in 1975, um, and I was going to start the academy in uh, late 78, and um, after completing all the testing, I wound up getting a letter that the city was freezing hiring. So we were told that we were going to start in the next class, which was uh, it turned out to be January of 1980. So I've been with the Chicago Police Department for 36 years. Uh, my father, uh, God bless, he's 91. He did 37 years. Mm. Um, and I have a son who will hit his 10th year next month in December, who wears the star number that my dad wore, <clears throat> that I used to wear, and now he wears it. I did... Um, patrol work like everyone else does when I first come on. I was working in the Uptown District. After that, I went to uh, gang crimes. I worked in a gang crime unit for almost 14 years. Mm. Made detective in my 17th year, went to bomb and arson, worked as a, a uh, arson investigator, wound up working uh, full-time for the Fraternal Order of Police for a while. Um, a detective trainer, I trained new sergeants, I rewrote curriculum for training, I received my doctorate from Loyola in 2005, and I've been teaching at higher ed off and on for 22 years. And uh, it was about almost three years ago that I decided to run for the position of president to um, help restore the, uh, the credibility and the, uh, the fraternalism within the Fraternal Order Police. Great, great. So now to that second part of that. So, so what is it that is your primary uh, responsibilities and duties as president of the uh, Chicago Lodge? Well, we've got uh, 17,500 members. Those mm. members are made up of uh, retirees and active, and they're below the rank of sergeant. So it's detectives and patrol officers. Um, as the president of the uh, Fraternal Order Police, our responsibilities deal with um, collective bargaining rights, uh, wages, um, just cause, um, discipline, um, health, you know, benefits, and um, and insurance, and you name it. Uh, our contract has grown from a 60-some page document uh, from the first one in 1980 to um, uh, we're closing in on 200 pages probably by the next. Oh my month. goodness! Mm -hmm. So so. As you represent your clients, do uh, uh, these are in fact your clients, uh, police officers? Is that am I correct? Constituents. Your more constituents. Or less. Mm -hmm. Oh, constituents. Okay. So, do you do you feel any need or any uh, responsibility to to have a concern about what the public thinks or what public opinion may be, or is it just you know these are your constituents and and you need to represent them? Well. Police officers are part of the public, and, and I think that's what people, you know, are, are losing focus on recently. Um, these are moms and dads, soccer moms, baseball dads. We coach basketball, football, soccer. Um, uh, we're, we're involved in churches. We have deacons and ministers. Um, so these are people that are all stakeholders in the city of Chicago. Um, we all live here. We raise our families here. And, uh, and we're a very uh, concerned part of the community where 
we don't want to see the stats, the violence and the crime stats continue uh, to, to increase because this is our city and our neighborhood as well. So uh, do we have a concern about our our um, view or how we're viewed in the public eye? Sure we do. You know, we're, we're a professional organization and we're like any other collective bargaining union outside of the strike clause where we protect our members and their rights and, and their livelihood, which is actually their job. Okay. So let's get into some of, uh, some of, the, uh, some of the issues that have come up in the uh, past year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, uh, according to uh, some of the uh, information in the media, there seems to have been information that FOP was critical of um, the uh, Police Accountability Task Force that was chaired by Lori Lightfoot. And, uh, and so why don't you just talk to us about what it was that you had, if you had, uh, issue with what uh, came out with the uh, Police Accountability Task Force. How much time do we have? <laughs> um, <laughs> briefly, briefly yeah, talk yeah. about it, okay. Um, you know, I, uh, as an instructor of higher education, I, I teach my students and I've always taught students, whether it's in the police academy, masters or undergrad programs, um, it's all about credibility. Your name walks into that room far before you arrive. Um, and, and I find the report to be incredible based on a lot of uh, statistical uh, data that they tried to bring forward. So when you're incredible, or when your credibility, when you have credibility on page one, you lose it on page two, it's hard to regain it on page three. Okay. Um, the, the, the data that they used with the, uh, with the street stops, let's say, um, focuses on, on populations of color being stopped at a higher um, rate um, that's being reported than, than, than Caucasians. So when you look at the locations of the statistics, you're looking at areas, and I remember I, I laid this out for Ms. Lightfoot on, on uh, Chicago um, tonight one night, and I said to her that if you look at what's taken into consideration the 11th district on the west okay. side, it's a smaller district uh, geographically, um, then the 16th district, it's about a quarter of the size. But you have 444 police officers assigned there on a daily basis as part of the assignments to the 11th district. And besides that, the, the, because of the shootings and the narcotics and, and the weapons, which the 11th district leads um, in arrests and, and, and in, in murders in that area, you the, or the department deploys the gang teams, the gun teams, the saturation teams, and narcotic teams. So you're over deployed by the daily assignment personnel, and then you deploy on a regular basis the outside units. So when you look at the population that are there for the crime, not the ethnicity, you you should expect an increase in numbers. And when I brought this to her. Um, and I also asked if she removed African-American officers that stop African-American citizens or Hispanic officers in Pilsen that stop Hispanic citizens. Um, she said, well, why would we? Some things are just obvious. Well, again, that doesn't, that doesn't answer the question. Um, so there are some stats in there that are, that are a bit incredible. If you look at the four forums, the open forums that she had, 155 people came to the microphone. Out of those 155 people, because I watched each and every one, I wrote down the names of the people that came to the mic, who they represented, what their issue was, and um, out of those 155, 129 were actually individuals, because there's repeaters that come to multiple sessions. Um, and I asked if she went and did a canvas, mm -hmm. knock on a door and go in a living room and talk to somebody because that environment is not conducive to a person that wants more police or more policing in her area because now people know where she lives, who she is. So you're getting a population that is very minimal compared to the two million plus that reside in Chicago and that 129 uh, voices that were unique to those four different forums is driving the narrative of of that accountability task force report and again I find that to be a bit incredible to think that that's the voice of Chicago when no one took the initiative to knock on a door no one took the initiative to go to a church or a community group or a senior center and talk to people that want that corner cleared off so they can send the kids 
to the store, you know, kids are out there, instead of catching baseballs, they're catching bullets. And, and, and that's not what childhood should be in this city. Got it. Uh, we're going to come back to a couple of more <coughs> topics on that, but right now, let's, I want to remind our viewers that you can call in. Uh, this is live and interactive. 312-738-1060. Uh, Let me check and see if we have a caller on the line. Is there a caller on? Yes. Go ahead, caller. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, the question is, uh, with the mayor's and the superintendent's push uh, to hire a 1,000 new officers, will this just be sporadic at best, or will this be consistent uh, for the next few years? Uh, you know, the exam hasn't been always offered consistently. Um, so just trying to get a little feedback on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, caller. So, so the question is, is this going to be a consistent hiring or is this going to be sporadic or, you know, are they going to be putting people in the academy every month? I think that's what the caller was trying yeah. to ask. Uh, uh, did they um, share with you or are you aware? A, a little bit. You know, I've got a meeting with the superintendent coming up next week or uh, maybe at the end of this week. I should have asked Doreen before I sat down. But um, if it was up to me, we'd hire 2,000 right now. <laughs> the last numbers that I saw, we were at... Um, 11,958 okay. and and I think the mayor wants to get to 13,000 plus um, that's going to take a lot of hiring just to stay through attrition we're going to lose 400 people by the end of this year okay. and we've got another 300 people that are online to be gone by June of next year so if you look at those numbers alone it's going to take a long time to just meet those numbers because the academy is six months long Right, uh, just the attrition. Right, factor. just to keep up with attrition. So then to get to that 13,000, um, I'm hoping that the academy might go to two shifts, days and afternoons. Okay. And just load up that building and get these, these young kids back on the street or get them on the street where we desperately need them. Right. You know, I know we have a lot of really important stuff to talk <clears throat> about, but there's also a really, really important event that took place late last night, and I think we would be remiss if we didn't... Uh, yes. uh, Say uh, congratulations to the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> I know that is um, uh, may not go over that well with the uh, superintendent, him being a diehard uh, Sox fan. But I'm sure even he and all of the uh, citizens in 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 the city of Chicago are really really proud of the heroic effort that the uh, Cubs put on last night to win the World Series. So I just wanted to yeah. take a, a quick second out to say congratulations to the uh, Cubs here. Now I know what to bring them. <laughs> now you know yeah. what to bring them. Okay, as long as it's White Sox, it's, that's well, all you can bring I'll, the Super Bowl. Maybe a little blue, I think. Okay, yeah. okay. So, but let, let, let's, let's, let's move on to um, the uh, Department of Justice is here. Yes. And they're doing uh, patterns and practice review of the uh, Chicago Police Department. And in many instances, uh, I mean, I think there were several settings where they would call officers in mm -hmm. and, or at least allow officers to come in and interview them about what they were seeing on the streets or how they felt about how things were being run and so forth and so on. What are your thoughts on that? Well, in November of 15, um, um, Lisa Madigan put out a letter uh, calling for the, for the uh, DOJ to come. Mm -hmm. And um, although the mayor and the superintendent at that time were under the uh, opinion that it was unnecessary, um, I got on the phone right away with our national president, and I spoke to Chuck Canterbury and Jimmy Pasco, our executive director out in Washington, and I asked them if they could help facilitate a meeting with um, Loretta Lynch. So the last week of November, I was already on the schedule for the first Tuesday of December. Um, to go to, um, or second Tuesday of December, to get into um, a meeting with Loretta Lynch and her staff. I, I went out there, uh, I was scheduled to fly, I flew in on a Tuesday, she announced she was coming on, on Monday, but I was already on her schedule, and I brought our contract books, I brought my background, my resume, um, I brought some discs that we did about uh, community relations in the FOP, and, um, and on that Tuesday, we, or Wednesday morning, we met, but it was the same day that Santa, San Bernardino hit. So the president was meeting with Miss Lynch, and I met with her number two um, um, person, uh, Vanita Gupta, mm -hmm. Zach Farden, and a whole litany of uh, attorneys from the DOJ. Our national president, myself, Jimmy Pasco. We sat for a couple of hours, we discussed, 
um, their, uh, their direction, their intention. We talked about the previous reports and I opened up the FOP building to help facilitate communication with them because we didn't want our members to go to the workplace, go into the commander's office, sit for a half hour with the DOJ and come out and be ostracized. Okay. The FOP is their building. They own that. That's owned by the members. So they feel a bit more comfortable coming in. So we scheduled a couple of talking dates and some meetings and we facilitated, I believe, three or four different mm -hmm. meetings with our members. I've met with them, with my board of directors, um, uh, at least three, four times, and I just had another meeting with them as recently as the 25th. Great. L let me just <coughs> back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and When does this contract expire? Our contract expires uh, in June of 17, June 30th. Okay. Are you uh, already in... Uh, have you started negotiations? Are you in deliberations? No. Have you had conversations with the uh, city's attorneys? Or well, I had a conversation with one of the city attorneys <laughs> about it, but uh, okay. you know, I've I just started to uh, put together our core team of our our the FOP's core team of negotiating uh, members. to uh, come forward with us and help us negotiate the contract. Thanks. And um, the city is generally slow at getting to the negotiation mm -hmm. table. There have been some times we sat the FOP and the patrol and detectives um, for three, four years working on the old agreement because it just is uh, a slow process. Right. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, how the public feels about the current <coughs> contract. And so kind of uh, a two-pronged question mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, do you anticipate that the current uh, patterns and practice review by the Department of Justice, uh, do you feel that it's going to have any impact on the contract going, go, 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 going forward? And, 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 um, and then secondly, talk about how some of the benefits and the things that are in the contract as it is now, uh, how that came to be as opposed to uh, giving raises in, in the past, mm -hmm. you know. So why don't we just start with the uh, impact, if any, that you well, think there might be with the uh, DOJ's... Uh... Sure. Well, we, you know, that's why I brought the, the contract books to Washington when we first went out there. I wanted them to see our contract book. There's nothing in our contract book that's illegal or violates anyone's civil rights. Um, you know, and that's what the DOJ is here for. They're looking at the department's pattern and practice. Does anything in our agreement impede the civil rights of an individual, whether it's a police officer or a, uh, or a civilian? And we've had attorneys on this since the first agreement. Mm -hmm. The city's had attorneys on this since the first agreement. There's nothing in our contract that's illegal. So, so what no, they no, can do... Me, uh, so let me just ask you. So, <clears throat> it, it, so you don't anticipate then that the Department of Justice will be able to change anything in the current contract, or have they even hinted that they might try? Well, they brought some issues forward in the last meeting we had, and okay. they had questions and concerns about some of the aspects of the contract. But what the DOJ can do is, is suggest for the city to negotiate certain components either in or out of the contract okay. um, going forward. So they'll have a direction that the city should take but it, it is a negotiation process. So there is going to be some language I'm sure that the city's going to come forward with mm -hmm. that's going to be DOJ orientated or um, community orientated, but I don't think a lot of people realize what our contract does and doesn't do. Okay. So talk to me uh, <coughs> about that uh, second part of it, uh, about trade-offs uh, and that, mm -hmm. that you've, um, the gains that you have in terms of certain protections in the contract. Uh, well, yeah, there, there's w one of the things that, that's come up about our contract is an officer's ability to change a statement if a video exists. So if, if, uh, if IPRA or COPA going forward or IED has a video um, and an officer makes a statement and then the officer gets eyes or gets an opportunity to watch the video, the way the language reads, and this came up in Washington when I was out there, the way the language reads is that an officer can change their statement without any um, um, fear that they're going to be hit with a Rule 14, which is a false uh, official false. report. Mm -hmm. That appears on its surface that we pull the fast one on the city or on the department. 
But what we wanted in our contract, and what I told DOJ in Washington, is that we wanted to watch videos, if they existed, prior to making a statement, so that the officers could be accurate. If it was a stressful situation involving, you know, the use of weapons or involving, you know, hands-on arrests, if an officer was either, you know, beat or had, had to forcibly take someone into custody, and it was captured on video, that they could review it. And this, and it, at the negotiation table, they said no, but we'll let you look at it and change the statement if we have one. I, to me, that makes no sense. To the DOJ, it made no sense when I told this to them. And when they asked me why, I said, I don't know, but when you get to Chicago, ask them. And you still haven't gotten there? No. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, there's so much that we want to talk about. I know you mentioned uh, COPA, this new Citizen Office mm -hmm. of uh, Police Accountability. Um, that, 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 were you, was FOP uh, consulted when they started down this road? A little bit. You know, they, they had the, the uh, municipal ordinance, ordinance put together. They had it in draft form. It's changed probably five or six times. Some of our input was taken. It was more or less legal language and cleanup time frames and, and issues of consistency. But the substance of the report is pretty much, I think, um, accountability task force orientated, community orientated, and uh, litigation orientated with a little with a lot less input from the FOP or the PB and the PA who represent the sergeants, lieutenants, and captains. Okay, I, I know you know there are several things we want to talk about. Let me just <clears throat> ask you. Uh, I think there was considerable discussion about whether or not the you felt or FOP or the officers felt that they had gotten a, a fair shake when the recommendation to fire several of the officers in the Laquan McDonald investigation. I, I, and I think I recall even uh, Lori Life from the uh, Police Accountability Task Force uh, kind of intimated that she didn't think that all of the uh, uh, procedures had been followed. What, what are your comments on overall in terms of the recommendation um, to, to fire those officers? Well, you know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of moves afoot on, 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 against police officers, you know, administratively, that I think are driven by the politics behind it. You know, whether people want to admit it or not, it, we have officers that are being adjudicated for um, incidents that are 12 years old. And, and they've already signed up for the, uh, accepting a certain amount of penalty, and they're saying, no, we're not going to mm. take that, what we offered before, and we're going to move to separate you. So I think that there's a big push to say, look how many people we're moving to separate since we got in this position. And right or wrong, you know, that's where we're at right now. And, and we'll address those on a on a case by case basis, but on on the the case that you mentioned on the McDonald case, where officers have been, you know, subjected or in the process of being subjected for separation, you know, we don't know the circumstances that they're justifying the separation. We've got thirteen thousand pages of documentation. Mm. Um, okay. You know, which individuals were being told that they falsified a report where were they in that situation of that of that that video you know, we don't know exactly you know all the specifics about it but we will address it as we go forward mm, okay you know i mean there are any any of these topics that we've just covered so far we could spend a whole show doing mm -hmm. a, and and there are so many things that we want to talk about that we're mm -hmm. not going to be able to, to talk about but i i do want to get this one in uh tell me uh, what, what what your thoughts are on part of that police accountability task force and even comments made by the mayor that uh, racism exists in the uh, Chicago <laughs> Police Department and, in, and with the uh, police accountability task force they, they even talked about the alleged racism and, and uh, along with sy uh, systemic failures throughout the uh, department. Yeah and that's one of the issues I have. One of, one of the major issues I have with the report and also the statements the mayor made was you know it it, it seems like there's a a move afoot <clears throat> for political reasons to justify uh, a history of what some people think is an abusive agency. You've been on this, you were on this department for 36 years. I'm on my I'm in my 36th year right now. Um, there's an old saying, and I'm sure you're going to smile when I say mm -hmm. this. Do we're not racist. We don't like anybody. 
<laughs> we we don't like people that are out there doing wrong to individuals, that are out there victimizing individuals, that are out there selling poison to our kids or firing weapons at at at, at a crowd without any sort of consideration to who they hit. You know, we've got 23 children that are 12 years or less that have been shot. 11 died so far this year. Um, we get upset with that. When we go to work, no one goes to work to look at an individual uh, at their ethnicity and perform differently than they would uh, with someone else that looked differently than that person. It's about police work. It's about criminal profiling. When I worked on the west side in the gang unit, if an individual was driving through an alley with a suburban city sticker and was Caucasian in Washington and Pine, I knew he wasn't there to buy cigarettes. You know, that kid's from Westchester buying heroin. So it's criminal profile, and it's not based on his ethnicity. It's based on what people do, and they fit a pattern. Um, it was... It's, it's part of policing that non-police really don't get. That's why I'm encouraging politicians, um, elected officials from Springfield or from the city council to get in a squad car and drive around with these kids that are out there in some of our busier areas and see what they do, see the kinds of calls they take in, see the kinds of, uh, of, uh, of street stops that they're engaged in. And I think once they do, they'll get a completely different perspective on on what makes up a Chicago police officer's work day. Okay, our time is running down, and I, I just want to get uh, one more question in, be, mm -hmm. and, and uh, ask you to be brief on it. Mm -hmm. talk, to, talk to me about the diversity within uh, uh, FOP, in, in, in the uh, top leadership of FOP, mm -hmm. and, and what you've done in terms of outreach to the community or to other organizations uh, throughout the uh, department and right. I and I gotta ask you to be brief on this. Yeah, well I came to your organization before I was running. I came okay. to Noble and I asked for participation and uh, I wanted to make and one of my big pushes for the for the FOP was to have the boardroom look like the roll call room. Guys, girls, Hispanics, African Americans, Caucasians, people from younger seniority and senior you know, senior years. Um, we didn't get that in the election. And, and I promised that I would, I would make a change. And when two openings occurred on my board of directors, one of the, the first individual that was placed was a African-American male. And when the second um, position opened up, um, we placed, or I placed, a uh, African-American female. So we would have people of color sitting on that board, involved at that table, um, not only making good on my promise, but also to make good to the membership and give them the realization that this is everyone's FOP. Great, great. Again, uh, we're going to have to ask you to come back. There's just Definitely. so much stuff that we need to cover that we, we're not going to have a chance to mm -hmm. cover tonight. We want to remind our viewers that this is uh, Noble TV on Can TV 21. This is the place to go to get the latest information with respect to what's going on in law enforcement across the metropolitan area and what is being done in conjunction with working with our communities to, to regain, maintain, and sustain uh, public trust. And, and so you need to tune in every Thursday at 7.30 right here at CAN TV so that you can see that. And I, I'm, I'm going to close tonight uh, and by thanking you for being here with us and only if you promise to come back again. Sounds good. Thank so, you very so much. So please do that. And uh, I'm Gene Williams from Noble <coughs> TV. And I uh, thank uh, President Angelo for being here. And so here's the uh, last thing we want to uh, close with you, and that is please go out and vote. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday.